April 11, 1970. Pad 39A, Kennedy Space Center. The Saturn V, 363 feet tall, roared to life with 7.5 million pounds of thrust. This was Apollo 13, America's third attempt to land men on the moon. To the public, it looked routine, but in spaceflight, nothing was ever routine. Every launch was a gamble. What followed was not the calm of a normal mission, but the storm of disaster and a desperate fight to bring three men home. Jim Lovell, Commander, a veteran of Gemini 7, Gemini 12, and Apollo 8. Apollo 13 was his fourth flight, his second journey to the moon. Fred Hayes, Lunar Module Pilot, trained first as a Marine aviator, then as a U.S. Air Force pilot, before becoming a NASA test pilot. He had never flown in combat, but few men were more skilled in the cockpit. And Jack Swigert, command module pilot, brought in just three days before launch when Ken Mattingly was grounded. Swigert was not a stranger to the spacecraft. He had completed full simulator training as Mattingly's backup but he had little time to integrate with Lovell and Hayes as a crew. The rocket, designated SA-508, flew perfectly, stage after stage lit as designed. The spacecraft separated, performed transposition and docking, and set course for the moon. The target, the Fra Mauro Highlands, a site geologists believed held clues to the moon's earliest history. Apollo 13 would be the first to study it. Fifty-five hours into the mission, the crew finished a live television broadcast. Minutes later, Jack Swigert was instructed to stir the oxygen tanks, a routine housekeeping procedure. He flipped the switch. At 9.08 p.m. Houston time, a bang shook the spacecraft. Warning lights flared. Odyssey shuddered. And Jim Level's calm voice carried across the void. Houston, we've had a problem. The cause lay deep in the service module. Oxygen tank number two, mounted in bay four, had exploded. Its story went back years. In 1965, the tank had been dropped during installation at North American Aviation's Downey plant. Repairs were made, but in 1969, as Apollo 13 prepared for flight, Ground crews used 65-volt power to boil off excess oxygen. The tank's heater thermostats were rated only for 28 volts. The mismatch overheated the wiring, charring away Teflon insulation. When Swigert powered the stirrer in flight, the exposed wires arced, igniting the oxygen. The blast blew an entire side panel off the service module. Within minutes, two of the three fuel cells were dead. The command module was losing power. Oxygen vented into space. Odyssey could not sustain life. The crew shut it down and retreated into Aquarius, the lunar module. Designed for two men for about 45 hours, it would now shelter three men 
for nearly 90 hours. A lifeboat never meant for such a role. Oxygen in Aquarius was not the problem. Carbon dioxide was. As the crew exhaled, CO2 levels climbed. The LM's lithium hydroxide canisters were too small to keep up. The command module had plenty of spares, but they were square and the LM's system took round cartridges. Incompatible. On flight day six, CO2 levels approached danger. In Houston, engineers worked around the clock, building a crude adapter from plastic bags, cardboard, and tape. Controllers read the steps up to the crew. They assembled the device by hand, cramming the square canisters into the LM's round system. Against all odds, it worked. The air cleared. Power was scarce. Aquarius carried four batteries, two large descent stage units, and two smaller ascent stage backups. Together, they provided only a fraction of the energy needed for a prolonged mission. To save power, Houston ordered a near total shutdown. Guidance systems, heaters, lights, all off. Cabin temperatures fell to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Water was rationed to sips. Food went half-eaten. Fred Hayes developed a fever and a urinary tract infection. The men's hands froze. Their breath condensed into floating droplets. Still, they endured. Apollo 13 was already outbound toward the moon. The only way back was to swing around its far side, a free return trajectory. But the course was not perfect. It required corrections. Using the lunar module's descent engine, Level and Hayes performed three burns. The most famous, the PC plus two burn, was aligned not by computer, but by hand. With guidance powered down, Level held the spacecraft on course by sighting Earth through the LM window, aligning its crescent against the crosshairs. It was dead reckoning on a scale no pilot had ever faced. And it worked. As Earth drew near, the crew jettisoned the service module. For the first time, they saw the damage, an entire panel gone, the oxygen tank's cavity ripped open. There's one whole side missing, Lovell radioed. Only then did Mission Control realize how violent the explosion had been. Next, Aquarius, their lifeboat, was cast adrift. It had kept them alive, but could not return to Earth. Only Odyssey remained, cold, dark, silent. To re-enter, it had to be powered up from nothing. Controllers on the ground, led by John Aaron, devised a stripped-down 15-amp restart sequence. The crew followed it step by step. Lights came on. Odyssey lived again. On April 17th at 1807 UTC, Apollo 13 hit Earth's atmosphere at 24,500 miles per hour. Radio blackout began. The predicted silence was 3 minutes 23 seconds, but this time it stretched on. 4 minutes, 5 minutes, 520, the longest blackout of Apollo. Tension gripped mission control. 
Then, a signal. Parachutes deployed. Odyssey splashed down in the Pacific, just four miles from the recovery ship, USS Iwo Jima. Against all odds, the crew had made it home. Apollo 13 never reached the moon, but it proved something even greater, that disaster could be turned into triumph. The crew returned alive because thousands of engineers, controllers, and technicians refused to let them die. The lessons were immediate. Oxygen tanks were redesigned. Wiring standards were overhauled. Emergency procedures were rewritten. Apollo 13 had exposed flaws, but also revealed NASA's greatest strength, its people.